that's going back and forth. Um, so as we uh, keep going here, you can see the bogey deployment that's uh, on both sides of the mobility back. You see those wheels, the back two wheels on either side swing down. That causes a little bit of rocking of the rover as expected, but you can kind of see that kind of settles out a little bit uh, right as we enter the those wheels, the back two wheels on either side swing down. That causes a little bit of rocking of the rover as expected, but you can kind of see that kind of settles out a little bit uh, right as we enter that, that, uh, that plume and dust cloud as we get down and touch down. And the video ends at touchdown, of course, because the camera that's taking this video uh, is about to leave this area in a hurry uh, on that descent stage after we, uh, we cut it loose from the rover. Um, so now let's take a look at the uh, rover upload camera. So now staring up at the, uh, at the descent stage from the rover. So here we go, we got a really close up look at the descent stage and we can start rolling that. Um, you can see the descent stage as the rover begins to fall away from it um, and see the effect of that rover wobble from the mobility deploy. So pausing here, the first thing that most people will probably notice is that there's no, uh, no plumes or no visible smoke or anything else coming out of the rockets at the corner of the descent stage. And that's expected. Hydrazine doesn't really, isn't, isn't a combustion uh, reaction when we, when we burn it. Uh, the exhaust products are nitrogen and hydrogen, which are clear. So we expect the, uh, the plumes to be clear. That's what we see in tests here on Earth as well. Uh, so I can promise you those engines are on though. Uh, one thing you can see in, those, in the Earth testing we do is that the chambers, the thrust chambers of those engines get kind of hot and glow pink. And you can kind of see that in the engines here, especially if you look at the, uh, the, the engine at the very top right of this image. If you look closely right above the, uh, the engine bell there on the thrust chamber, you can see little streaks of pink on there. And that's what's happening. The, uh, as the engines have been on for a long time, they get really hot. Um, and that heat uh, shows up there in those pink stripes that we see. Uh, so take a look at that closely when you get a chance to, uh, to look at the image in some detail. As with the previous uh, videos, you can see the bridles uh, that are supporting the weight of the rover there at the bottom now of this image, and that umbilical, again, transferring, uh, transferring data back and forth between the test stage and the rover. Um, so let's keep going a little bit more. Uh, you'll see the image begin to wobble a little bit here. I can promise you it's not the descent stage wobbling, it's actually that rover tipping back and forth a little bit as we saw as the mobility deploys, both the first initial mobility deploy and then the, the, uh, the bogeys uh, deploying. Um, as we near touchdown, let's slow it down a bit and uh, proceed in slow-mo here. Um, so now we're watching about quarter speed. Things are getting pretty dusty here as we get down, down toward the bottom. Uh, take a look here at the bottom left of this picture. Um, you'll see actually the instant that we cut the descent stage away. Uh, and you'll see those idols begin to get retracted up toward that descent stage as they're pulled up. And this is as planned. There they go. See as they got uh, yanked up there uh, right before. And then we'll see the uh, descent stage begin to turn and ascend and head out uh, toward the northwest with the uh, umbilical dangling behind it. Um, since the rover was pointed uh, almost directly to southeast, the descent stage chose to, to go toward the back. Uh, that's also to make sure, of course, that the, uh, the engines don't plume the rover, that we don't damage the rover. Uh, with those, uh, that engine thrust. Uh, so we sent that descent stage uh, off to the northwest, which uh, Jessica will show you about in a little bit. Um, so I can and have uh, watched those videos for hours and keep seeing new stuff every time. Um, so I invite you all to do that too. Um, so now I'll turn it over to Justin, who, uh, who will talk to you a little bit about the images we've been taking on the ground. All right, thank you, Al. Uh, I'm Justin Mackey. Uh, I'm uh, the Mars 2020 Perseverance uh, imaging scientist here, uh, and I develop imaging systems at JPL. And uh, when when Dave asked me to help out with the EDL cam development about uh, six years ago, uh, we were I was really excited about it. I knew it would be challenging and interesting, um, and even possibly spectacular. But I had no idea that it would be this amazing, and we are so happy and proud. And I just want to thank Dave and Matt for just giving us the leadership and giving us the chance to do this. Um, like Matt and Dave and Jennifer and Rick and others on the project, I've, I've actually worked on all five of the NASA rover missions, and as part of my job, I review images from Mars like every day, that's what I do. And when I saw these uh, images come down, um, I have to say, I was truly amazed. And um, I know it's been a tough year um, for everybody, and uh, we're hoping that maybe these images will you know help brighten people's day. Um, you know, your smartphones and uh, make them your your screen backgrounds and things. I'm just really happy that it all worked out. So, uh, so now we're on Mars, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing over the weekend. Um, um, over the weekend, uh, we deployed the RSM. And if you go to the first picture, there's a picture of the remote sensing mast, the RSM, 
uh, which is that mast on the rover, and you can see the, um, the navigation cameras up there, the left and right navigation cameras, or nav cams as we call them. Um, this is another new imaging system that we've uh, developed here specifically for the 2020 mission. Um, these cameras represent a pretty significant advancement over um, previous imaging systems that we've flown. These are 20 megapixel color cameras with very high resolution and wide angle lenses um, that we use to basically map out the surface as the rover drives and then we use these images to do planning and things. And so we, um, the first thing we did after we deployed the mast is we started imaging the surface. So the next slide uh, shows one of our first images from the cameras. Uh, this image is actually in low resolution mode. Uh, so it's one quarter of the full resolution of the, of the camera. So it's been, it's been shrunk down. Uh, but you can see right there the vista that we're seeing. This is uh, the rover, obviously, on Mars. And you can see some of the material that landed on the deck. Uh, but everything looks in, in good shape. And so we're using these images to inspect not only the vehicle, but uh, the surface around us. Uh, the next slide shows the view down towards the surface. You can see the wheels there. Um, this is the same surface you just saw in the EDL cam videos. You can see some of the scouring that the uh, rocket plumes did for us, clean it off, make it nice and clean so we can take pictures of it, and dust it off for us. Um, the next slide shows a view looking out towards the south. Um, and this, just an amazing scene here. Uh, this is it, this is Mars. We're, we're here in our place that we're gonna be exploring over the next uh, months and coming years. And it's just really exciting to see, um, you know, these scenes look familiar to us. You know, they look Earth-like in a sense. You know, you see the, the mountains back there and the rocks and things. It's just uh, really is the surface of an alien world. And uh, we just arrived. You can also see some more scouring there over on the right. Uh, the next image looks over towards the west. You can see the delta up, out there on the horizon. And again, more scouring from the, uh, the rocket plumes. Uh, and then we take all of these images and we uh, stitch them together into panoramas. And so that next, uh, the next frame shows the full panorama from the nav cam uh, stitched together. We're still working out the calibration and things. So this is, uh, you know, approximate color, um, but it just gives you a feel for the vista here that we, we're, uh, our new environment that we're going to explore. Uh, and we're hoping uh, everyone will join us uh, in um, Seeing these images, we're, uh, today we're going to be releasing a whole slew of raw images. Um, it's been a fire hose of data, basically. We have thousands of images already from the EDL cameras, nav cams, uh, you've seen the has cams. And so we will be putting those uh, out on the website today uh, for people to download and uh, process yourself or just look at the great pictures, find your favorite picture and uh, make, it, make it your screen background. And, and then the last um, image that I just wanted to point out is the um, First image, one of the first images from the Mastcam Z camera. This is another next generation imaging system on the rover. Um, Jim Bell is the, dep uh, the PI, I'm, I'm the deputy PI for this, uh, working with our um, industry partners, MS Cubed down in San Diego. Um, this is just a fantastic imaging system. This is a preview of things to come. This system has a zoom lens on it. That's what the Z stands for. Uh, and we're, we are going to get incredibly high resolution photos uh, from this imaging system. I just wanted to point out a few things in this picture. On the far right, you could see those cables uh, where they had been cut uh, in the video that you just saw. So there's kind of a close-up of that. Uh, and then just in the middle to the left of that, that black uh, instrument, that, that's uh, the rover upload camera. That's the camera that actually took the video of the sky crane uh, as, as we were coming down. And then in the bottom of the frame is the Mastcam Z calibration target set. There's two of them. There's the circular one with the, the shadow post and then the color chips on the bottom. There's another Cal target in the back. That's the SuperCam instrument um, with our partners from Los Alamos and in France. Uh, we're going to be commissioning SuperCam over the next few days. And then finally, just as a teaser, I'll point out that there is a little antenna there to the right on that uh, box, the center right. That is the helicopter antenna. It's a helicopter base station location. And uh, preview of things to come. We're uh, excited about that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to talk about uh, latest status. All right. Thank you, Justin. I know you can uh, attest firsthand to being in the control room and the excitement that everybody has been experiencing seeing all these images from the surface. And uh, as they come down, you know, we're immediately sharing them and, and everybody clapping and smiles all around. So, great camera sweep. So I am happy to report that uh, Perseverance is healthy and uh, continuing with activities as we have been uh, planning them um, over the first few sols on the surface. 
uh, to date, uh, which is really only just you know three SALs of activities and one more, um, and coming up later this afternoon, uh, we've commanded five thousand. We've executed five thousand commands. So lots of uh, instructions to the vehicle for um, for her to perform, and uh, having everything come back exactly how we've been wanting it to, um, with respect to our health checkouts and um, our instrument uh, checkouts. So that's been, things have been going well. A uh, couple uh, key highlights. So we have fired and, and released um, our launch lock restraints to allow alarm mechanisms uh, to be deployed. We saw the remote sensing mast, uh, but uh, one of those also being the high gain antenna. Now this is um, important for the high gain antenna to be deployed because it increases our uplink rate um, to the rover. And so it will allow us to send a higher uh, volume of instructions uh, to Perseverance and allow her to perform uh, more involved activities over the days to come. Uh, additionally, with respect to our communication, uh, we have established a, a strong communication link with all of our relay orbiters and our partners, um, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the MAVEN Orbiter, Trace Gas Observer, the TGO, and Odyssey spacecraft. And so we thank those teams and um, are happy to be able to use those assets to relay all of the information that we, uh, all these beautiful images that we are looking at today. Uh, the remote sensing, mas remote sensing mast motion checks uh, were nominal and as expected. And um, all of our instruments have gone through their initial checkouts and we're happy to report that they are all performing um, nominally and as expected. Now, when I say nominal, it really means fantastic because uh, we can't uh, wait to continue to use this uh, payload suite. Our backup computer was turned on yesterday and uh, that was in preparation for our upcoming flight software. A transition which we'll, we will be performing over the next few days. And the Ingenuity helicopter has also been uh, checked out and we have performed a battery charging event which we will continue to perform over the weeks to come in preparation for that aspect of the mission. But looking ahead, uh, we uh, are excited to be, part, uh, to be on our surface flight software. Uh, this is a much more uh, surface capable, give a lot more capabilities for the surface mission as part of this flight software load. It will take us a few days uh, to transition, but once we're on that load, it will allow us to do further in-depth checkouts of the instrument, as well as deploy the robotic arm and exercise some of the turret um, items that you see in this image. So you can see that we have our coring drill in the center our Pixel and, and Sherlock instruments mounted to the side, and that black tank is to support the, gut, the gas dust removal tool, which will uh, remove uh, dust from the surfaces that we will be inspecting later. So uh, coming up here, the, uh, the wheels, uh, if you noticed in the image now, are off to the side. We will be performing a wiggle. We'll straighten those up. We'll do a short drive, uh, and as I mentioned, deploy the robotic arm um, and then continue with further in-depth checkouts. So we are very excited uh, to be happily on the surface and, uh, uh, and exercising our system and um, looking for what's ahead. So going back to uh, our partnership with the larger Mars um, spacecraft and science uh, teams and community, we're really excited that the MRO spacecraft, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the high-rise a team was able to find our hardware on the surface of Mars. And so if you see in this image, if the, the next pop-up, you can see that we have the descent stage, the parachute, and the heat shield all here um, in this image. With a few stats here, the descent stage is about 700 meters away uh, from uh, where Perseverance is on the surface. Parachute is about 1.2 kilometers and the heat shield about 1.5 kilometers. Uh, and so it's uh, very exciting that we can see all these uh, different components um, now that we've landed on the surface. And uh, as a special treat, uh, the high rise image was able to actually acquire um, the entry, descent, and landing uh, event from their perspective. And uh, we can never 
uh, uh, have enough images of this activity. And so this is a fantastic view. Uh, but I'm going to send it back to Dave here. He, uh, as part of this suite, we have one more surprise or one more uh, uh, gift, I'll say, um, that, uh, that we've been able to um, receive from this package. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Jessica. So I think we probably have overloaded your visual sense for a little bit. But we're going to do something a little bit different, and I'm going to have some fun here for a second, too. So I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to talk to you now with this. This is the microphone that was part of the EDL camera system. Um, when the EDL cam system was first envisioned, it was set up as just a bunch of cameras um, to capture some amazing imagery on the surface of Mars. And about a year or so after it was first conceived, I got a phone call, another call from Matt. After talking to headquarters, asked the question, could we possibly put a microphone as part of our EDL camera system? So we worked with the team, we took a look, and uh, sure enough, it was uh, something that, uh, that we could do. And so we started off that detailed design and uh, identifying a microphone that would work for us and uh, getting it onto the vehicle. About a year after uh, this first started, uh, I was giving a tour um, at GPL. And uh, I happened to mention to the group that I was giving the tour to that uh, the decision had come down and we were working to actually include a microphone onto, onto the vehicle. And after the tour was done, a gal came up to me and she said some things to me that I won't forget anytime soon. She said, I'm super excited that you guys are going to try to put a microphone onto the rover and get it to the surface of Mars. And, and I was very appreciative. And I asked her afterwards, I said, I'm curious, why is it that this relates to you so much? And her response was that her sister was visually impaired. Uh, she was not able to see these images that, uh, that, that we saw earlier or that we sent down in the past. And while she tries to describe them to her, she felt that she just can't quite capture that same sense of amazement that she gets when she gets in visually. And that by actually getting a microphone out of the surface of Mars, the hope was that she'd be able to experience things on Mars the same way that, uh, that she was when she actually looked at them. Um, and that stuck with me. We continued to work super hard to make sure that this microphone would work. And that's part of the reason we were disappointed why it didn't work when we actually went and did our entry, descent, and landing sequence. Um, I wish I had actually captured that uh, individual's name. I would love to reach out to her now and say, we've done it. I hope your sister is enjoying it. Because what I'm going to show you in a second, or what I'm gonna, you're going to hear in a second, is actually the first sounds being recorded from the surface of Mars. So there are two microphones on the Perseverance vehicle. There's this microphone here, which is part of the entry, descent, and landing system. And there's a second microphone that is on the SuperCam instrument. And we're, we're counting on both of these instruments recording some absolutely amazing uh, sounds from the surface of Mars. So with that, um, I invite you now to, if you would like to close your eyes and just imagine yourself sitting on the surface of Mars and listening to, to the surroundings. Uh, if I could have the first one, please. So that gentle whirl that happens in the background, that is a noise made by the rover. But yes, what you did here 10 seconds in was an actual wind gust on the surface of Mars, picked up by the microphone, and sent back to us here on Earth. The analysis indicates that was around a five meter per second type of a wind gust. Um, so we have actually, we can sit here now and, and actually tell you that we have recorded sounds from the surface of Mars. So we have a second one, which basically further reduces the noise of the rover so you can just hear uh, what the wind would sound like on Mars. And once again, I invite you to, to sit back and uh, have a listen to what it would sound like to be on Mars. It's just, it's cool. It's really neat, overwhelming, if you will. Um, I can't remember what I was going to go and say next. Um, so, 
Looking forward to doing some amazing things with the microphones going forward. We need to work with the ops team. There's some great science that they're, they're looking to do. We're hopeful that we continue to use these microphones, both the SuperCam microphone and the EDO cam microphone, to capture sounds, perhaps the rocks interacting with the surface. I think SuperCam is going to use theirs to get some great data of uh, them zapping rocks. So uh, as you've heard and we'll continue here, we're just beginning to do amazing things on the surface of Mars. And now Ken is going to talk to you a little bit about the science that we've done to date and what they're looking forward to doing as we continue to move forward. Thanks, Dave. And uh, I'll start by just taking this opportunity to say to Matt, Dave, Al, and everybody else on this fantastic team, thank you for the ride of a lifetime. That, that is just incredible what we've seen today and, and what I'm sure we'll, we'll continue to see as, as the mission unfolds. So with all the focus on these uh, spectacular videos and audio, uh, we wanted to make sure to remind you that there is plenty of science going on already with hundreds of team members pouring over every new image. So if we can get the first of those uh, images, uh, as you'll see in this NavCam frame, we start with what may seem like very basic observations, light rocks, dark rocks, holy rocks, that's holy with an E. Uh, we use these very generic terms at this early stage until we have more data that allow us to test our hypotheses uh, and make more confident interpretations. Follow along with the mission and you'll see that this is a theme. As we get closer, our view of Mars continues to resolve and a coherent story emerges. Next image, please. Finally, I just wanna briefly point out that we are finding real science value in these EDL cam videos. Here you can see a beautiful new perspective on the Jezero Delta. And if we can get the next image, also a new perspective on some of the beautiful stratigraphy around our landing site which is is up near uh, uh on the far right side of this image uh so now to put all of this in context for us i'll hand it over to dr thomas zubukin well what you've seen here today is really nothing short of amazing you know and I, perhaps you've had moments like this before some of you have told me that i was uh, too young to remember, but they had a moment like that, for example, when they observed the first landing on the moon. They had moments like that where it felt that we took a big leap, a big leap, not just in this case because of at JPL or at NASA, but a big leap as humanity. Uh, of course, it's a leap that was enabled by work over decades and on this mission for close to a decade. So what's possible today or what feels possible is different even than yesterday. It's how it feels to make history. And I just, that's how I feel today. I'm so moved by this, wow. The video of Perseverance descent and landing and the amazing panorama and the first white landscape shot of Chesro Crater seen with human eyes and the first Martian sounds are the closest you can get to landing on Mars without putting on a pressure suit. That video, I believe, should become mandatory viewing for young people who not only want to explore other worlds and build spacecraft to take them there, but also want to be part of diverse teams achieving all the audacious goals of our future. At the center of that is a team, and I'll ask for the next image. Now, you should know I met this team. I see me there in a dark suit uh, next to uh, Dr. Lori Glaze, the Planet Division Director, and Al, he just, uh, he just talked to you, is, is on his knee in there, and that's the entry descent and landing team. And we met him just hours before that historic landing. And I love this picture because, of course, the event today demonstrates that the human aspect of exploration. And that is, of course, every reason for what we can do at NASA and also why we do things. The video and audio images here uh, provided to us are from the surface of Mars. And sometimes we forget if we look at that. Well, Robert shouldn't get all the fun. Uh, we want to make sure that all of us on Earth see and feel what it's like to be on our Mars and explore other worlds. I'm so excited for the more than 1 million students who joined the Mars Student Challenge 
and that many more across the world will be inspired by these images released today and even yesterday. Their journey is also just the beginning. Just imagine, imagine Perseverance sitting on a hill recording the next Martian landing with a cargo that is basically a rocket and then the first from another world with samples bound for Earth that are collected by Perseverance now in the near future. Imagine follow the entry, descent, and landing of the first human crew on the planetary surface sometimes in the future. These future historic events, which I'm confident will happen, will be enabled by women and men working in diverse teams. Imagine the goals we can achieve together. So what is possible? Sometimes to address that question, it's good to look back and think where we've come from, just like my friend Mike did earlier. We've been on a journey, both as a human race for, for quite a while now, and I don't wanna show this next image of Sojourner of the Pathfinder mission, uh, which was designed for seven souls or Martian days or so, maybe 30, ultimately lasted for 85 Earth days in 1997. I remember that really distinctly. A true Pathfinder instead, in, indeed, it, you know, weighed 23 pounds and uh, returned a surprising amount of data back to Earth and a, a surprising amount of science for many scientists, I must say. <laughs> Some people didn't expect quite that much. And that's what happens sometimes too when you innovate, just like uh, we, we've seen here. We've grown from that seed. Now perseverance is the size of a small car and it's ready for us for the next shine leaps. And here's a picture that uh, we're putting up that is uh, one of the many pictures that uh, we're releasing. And of course, it's a picture, one of my absolute favorites. And that's a picture of the sample caching system on there because it's that sample caching system that will connect this mission to the samples that will bring back to Earth and other historic feed we're working on. This system is on the surface of Mars now. I remember distinctly looking at it before we packed it up uh, from JPL and moved it over. Then, of course, uh, launched it uh, from, from the top of a rocket. This, my friends, is one of the indelible moments in NASA's history where what we can see and what we can learn and what we can hope for in the future and the extraordinary emotions that takes ma makes us feel all of us coming together. That human element will fill our future at Mars, which is bright indeed. And it will fuel the dreams of a new generation that will return to Mars and also study the samples that we will eventually bring home. I'm so grateful to this team and literally the thousands, both at JPL and within the US and around the world, to all of you who have engaged in this mission. As has been noted, the raw image pipeline is opening up. Please go take a look at these data and play with them, especially those of you, uh, the children and the youth uh, that have signed up to our educational campaign. What can you find in these pictures? And who's going to compose the first piece of music with actual Mars sound? Mike, Matt, Jennifer, Al, many of you leaders, I could not be more proud of both you and your team. On behalf of our entire NASA leadership team, a heartfelt and a proud thanks to you. For the record, Matt, I'm so glad for your idea about these cameras. We will learn a lot from that, much more than we ever expected. And of course, this is just a start for the surface team. The real work starts now to evaluate the surrounding and start a plan and our trajectory across Chesero Crater. It's a big team and there are lots of discussions, but that's science in action. Stay with us. There is much more amazement to come. Back to you, Raquel. Thank you, Thomas. And we'll now move on to your questions. Remember, if you are a member of the media on the phone line, you can press star one to get into the queue. If you're on social media, you can tag questions with the hashtag Countdown to Mars. Now, starting on the phone line is Bill Harwood from CBS News. Yeah, hi. Um, I guess this is for Al or maybe for Matt. I mean, other than the 
the loose spring you guys saw in the heat shield, is there anything at all in that video that looked all phenomenal? I mean, you know, it, it looked like it was almost textbook. Um, and I'm not saying that just to, I don't know, give you free praise, but I didn't see, you know, I don't see anything like that. So is there anything? Thanks. Uh, we've been, I can take that one. Uh, we've been pouring over the, those videos and looking for anything that uh, that could be wrong and also looking at the rest of the data. And we did have a pretty clean run uh, through through entry, descent, and landing. Uh, there are a couple of bits of the, uh, par of the parachute lid uh, that came off. Um, some of that was expected. In fact, we knew that there was some risk of that as well. Um, and there was, uh, if you look at the video, you can actually see a chunk. Uh, that's the uh, the radome. It's a, uh, a cover. Uh, for one of the, uh, pair, the one of the Logian antennas we used during cruise and also during part of EDL, uh, that came off. Uh, we had hoped that it wouldn't, um, and we tried to restrain it uh, a little bit better, but we knew that it was a risk that it might. Um, so that's something we noticed uh, that's on there as well. There's a couple other little things that we've been taking a look at, uh, but I think you're in general right that the, uh, the entry, descent, and landing system behaved as expected, um, and it did what it had to do. Um, especially given, uh, and a big shout out to the uh, terrain relative navigation system, which put us down uh, in the safest spot that was available to us. Uh, the places that we had to choose from um, weren't great if we didn't have something like terrain relative navigation. So uh, yeah, the, the landing system worked great. Great, thanks Al. And up next we have Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Yes, hi, um, wonderful video. I'm just wondering, did the JPL team get to see snippets coming down of the video um, and then, or did you have to wait until this one minute uh, video was put together? What was the reaction when you saw, first saw the video and laid eyes on it? And, and for David, um, why do you think the mic didn't work during descent? Thank you. I can, uh, I can say a couple words about the, um, the first part. Um, I had trouble leaving this mission support area this week just because <laughs> I kept waiting for every little bit of information to come back from, uh, particularly from these cameras, but from the vehicle in general. And I can tell you, every time we got something, people were overjoyed, giddy. They were like kids, you know, in a candy store. Uh, you know, we'd get a little, we'd get a thumbnail, which literally is just a really low res, blobby looking thing. Of, of one of those videos that, that came down first, and we'd just be falling on the floor excited with what we were seeing, and that's before even the high res came. You know, um, there's a lot of people that have contributed to, uh, to this uh, entry, descent, and landing system. Our, uh, our chief engineer, Adam Stelzner, happens to be here in the, uh, the studio. He was kind of the father of the Sky Crane system. This started 15 years ago for him. He and his team have never seen this system operate before, not even on the earth, because we can't test it on the earth. So this is the first time we've had a chance as engineers to actually see what we designed. And uh, I just can't, it's hard for me to uh, express just how emotional it was and how exciting it was for everybody as we got this information down. Um, I'll turn it over to Dave to say a couple words. Hey Dave, before you say that, can I just chime in on the, the first yeah. image? Uh, this is Justin. I will say um, when when we get these first images from any of these imaging systems, <clears throat> the test images never look as good as the real thing. It's not even close. In fact, it's very hard to simulate a lot of these things, especially these you know sky cranes and things. And so the images that we normally see during test programs are um, you know there's always like a ladder in the background or the lighting's never quite right or there's a car. In the case of the EDL cams, we have these big targets out in parking lots and we were dodging cars to try to do our tests and things. And so uh, that moment that you get these images from Mars, it's, it's just kind of an electric feeling where it just all just snaps into place and you get these pictures that are just like perfectly, you know, they're pictures of Mars that you can never simulate here on Earth. And I think that we all experience that, uh, especially after you, we go through months and months of testing and it, the images don't really look that great. And, you know, people get skeptical, like, are these, these cameras really that great? Because, you know, that looks like a garage or something. Uh, so we're, it's just amazing to get these pictures. And I just, I think we all feel that way because we're all seeing pictures of insides of t labs and everything, and they're never that great, but, uh, it's amazing to get these photos from Mars. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my take. So, uh, Thursday evening and, and Friday when the, uh, data started to come down and, uh, we kind of realized what we had, I was sitting at home 
and my phone started to go off and I was getting FaceTimes from people who were in the MSA. And what was happening was that they were starting to show them on the monitors that we have hanging in the wall. And people were turning their phones around and saying, Gruel, you, you gotta see this reaction. And people were just <laughs> jumping up and down and giddy and ecstatic. And it, it, it was a great feeling. I mean, I, from where I was sitting, I only was excited to see these videos and what we had captured. It was also the fact that a lot of people had put in a lot of effort in to make this system work. And to actually reward that effort and to, to pay it back and, sh and, and get this excitement going, I, it, it made me super happy. I was glad to see that all the hard work, all the dedication had come in and that everyone was just excited about uh, not only what we had captured, but uh, also what this mission um, could do going fo forward. So, uh, it was a great feeling. It was a feeling I won't, I won't forget for, for quite some time. And then regarding the question about the microphone, uh, we started to look at it. What we think happened is that there was a community error between uh, the device that re is responsible for uh, digitizing the analog signals that the microphone picked up and then passing them back to the uh, the computer that actually stores all the data. We're not exactly sure why it happened. It could have been a fact that it was just so much data streaming into the system. We tested it, but, you know, obviously everything's a little bit different on Mars than we actually have here, here on the ground. So we were pretty quickly able to determine we didn't think there was a hardware issue with uh, the microphone, which is why we were able to uh, uh, approach the project and uh, get their concurrence to try to turn the microphone on then on that SOL2 boundary. Uh, it's just unfortunate that that error happened during an EDL and, and we just weren't able to record any of the data that, uh, that we generated uh, during the sequence. All right, thanks. And up next, we have Chris Davenport from the Washington Post. Hi, uh, thanks for taking the time and for showing us. I really appreciate it. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the cameras that were used to record the video. Uh, I understand they were specially designed maybe by a commercial company called SLIR Systems. Just curious to know like what goes into you know designing a camera to sustain the, the Gs, the blast of the thrusters, everything that it's got to go through to capture that images. Uh, thanks. Okay. so. The cameras were originally purchased from a company called uh, Point Grey, uh, which was then bought out by FLIR. Um, and I can tell you that uh, the modifications we made to the camera were minimal. This was not a camera specifically designed for use on Mars. You can purchase the same camera off the internet for whatever applications you might have for it. The only things we did is we actually uh, added some bonding material on the inside to try to make sure that uh, in the dynamic environment of launch and then uh, that mortar fire event that we talked about, uh, that the camera will continue to operate. And then we had to swap out a couple pieces on the inside because uh, in the vacuum of space, they had the uh, ability to outgas material. And if that material uh, deposited itself on the detector, then we wouldn't get the clear images that we actually got. But other than that, it was not specially designed for use for this application. It is a commercial off the shelf camera. Thank you. And up next, we have Michael Sheets from CNBC. Hi, Al. Congratulations again on capturing such uh, stunning footage of this landing. I'm curious on two aspects. I mean, one, Adam Seltzer, you know, you guys had said that in 15 years since he really engineered the sky crane, he never actually seen it in operation. I'm curious what Adam thinks about seeing this work on a planet. And, and secondarily, um, how this informs and how being able to actually see the landing informs future missions, even as uh, NASA looks to one day land astronauts. You know, what does this really teach you about uh, trying to get people on the surface of Mars? Uh, well, I, let's see, Adam's not up here, <laughs> but I can, uh, I can channel him for, for just a moment, perhaps, and, and tell you that uh, you know, this is a thrill of a lifetime, I think, not just for Adam, but all the people that uh, contributed uh, to, to this architecture development uh, back on Curiosity. I, I remember when we first briefed this, uh, this, this system, you know, with the supersonic parachutes and, uh, you know, multi-body systems, and we're gonna lower this thing on a tether, and people just looked at us like we were insane. You know, and uh, Adam uh, and, and his team, uh, of which Al was part, you know, they kept at it and they explained why it made sense. They explained why it was robust. They explained why it would work. 
It was not easy to build, I will tell you that, uh, as, as the flight system manager on, on Curiosity, but once you build it and once you test it, it's something uh, that really is designed inherently to interact with the uncertainties that Mars throw at you, throws at you. And, uh, and so I think uh, being able to see his system uh, operate like this, um, uh, you know, in high definition, uh, landing at Jezero, uh, you know, it doesn't get too much better than that, I don't think. So um, I'm going to throw it to Al. He can maybe say a few words about the types of technologies and, and information uh, that we have on the technologies on the system and information we got getting back from EDL and will be getting back as part of our reconstruction activity that feed into uh, the future. Yeah, I mean, I think we can talk about a lot of things. I mean, but uh, as Matt as Matt mentioned, you know, as a fresh faced kid, uh, when the sky was invented and I was in that room and, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see it finally in action, even though we knew it worked once, uh, we didn't know for sure it was going to work again and then for it to work again. And then for us to see it, um, is incredible. Um, and just starting with the sky crane there, you can see some things that I think are going to be useful to the future. Uh, one thing that's, uh, of course, of a lot of interest, especially as we start landing bigger things is the plume ground interaction, the interaction between those rockets, uh, and what they're doing to the ground and how they kick things around. And we've got great video of that here this time, uh, both from the Rover download camera and the descent stage download camera. We can see how those, uh, how they create those scours and stuff gets pushed together and creates a sheet underneath the Rover. Uh, we can see that all occurring. Um, so that's super useful. Uh, the parachute stuff too, one thing we didn't show uh, necessarily here is that, that uh, the parachute upload cameras, the two that we got, are at 75 frames per second. Uh, so we can see that uh, inflation, that only occurs in you know, 0.7 seconds, in less than a second, um, and see that snap open and look at all the details of how it unfolds and, uh, and how it's symmetrically inflated. Um, and all those things are very useful for future missions, uh, both whether they're landing more things and people or stuff and then people. Um, you know, SRL, other missions are going to use, future missions like the sample retrieval missions are likely going to use things like parachutes and rockets, of course. Uh, so we're very interested in seeing how, uh, how those, those cameras and what we see in, the, in, that, uh, in those camera images can teach us about how those systems are actually performing and uh, make our systems more robust in the future. Thanks, Alan, Matt. Up next, we have Ken Chang from the New York Times. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you can give me a few more details about how the data came back. So those 30 gigabytes that was collected, how much has come back, and what was the data rate that you were able to send them information back? Thank you. Maybe Jessica can... Uh, so, um, yeah. so I can say that as part of our commissioning activity, we actually walk the data rate up uh, over the course of our different overflights with the orbiters. And uh, so we start um, with... Uh, two. Uh, uh, very, a lower rate, um, 2,000, 8,000, and then we, mo we increase that into an adaptive data rate with the orbiter in which we can continue to go many uh, megabits, um, I'm sorry, two meg, eight uh, meg, and then uh, much b further beyond that um, over the course. Uh, the total volume that I don't have off the top of my head, and so maybe, I don't know if that's something that Dave or we can provide for you later. Justin, do you have how many, how many images we got back? From yeah, we counted, uh, so uh, we counted uh, yesterday for, that we're releasing today, there was a, about 4,500 that we've gotten so far that we're pushing out to the web today. Um, and I will mention that when the orbiters could fly overhead, uh, the compasses typically return, let's say 500 to 900 megabits per pass. And we've had, I don't know, um, well, we've had a lot of them now, like five or 10 of them. We've typically had about two to three overflights per night, and it does vary. The rates I was remembering are the communication rates from the rover to the orbiter. And then once that's collected, then we're anywhere from, you know, some passes will be smaller, 80 uh, to 100, and where we've had other passes, uh, which have been significant um, amounts of data up at 700. Um, and so it is variable per orbiter um, and per orientation. Yeah. And I want to add one more thing I wanted to mention about the, the camera technology and then this data. Um, it, we haven't mentioned it, but uh, in addition to use commercial cameras, um, we're using a commercial computer, an Intel-based PC that's running Linux, open source. So it's the first open source, at least that I know of, uh, open source Linux box running on the surface of Mars. It's actually inside the rover. It's, it's quite compact. Uh, and so there's the Linux operating system. And uh, we compress the video using FFmpeg, which is another open source tool. So Thank you to the open source community 
uh, for allowing us to use your amazing software. Appreciate it. I just, uh, just very briefly, I, I just want to note, as, as Jessica said, um, you saw some of the terrific imagery from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. We've been getting fantastic support from the Orbiter community, not just MRO uh, for, for both that imagery and the comms, uh, but also uh, from MAVEN, which is a Goddard space, spacecraft, from Odyssey, one of our older orbiters, uh, and from the ESA, European uh, trace gas orbiter as well, some of the biggest data volume passes we've had brought back a lot of this imagery came from our partners in Europe. And so thank you all to them. Great. And up next on the phone lines is Mike Wall from space.com. Thank you all for doing this. And yeah, yeah, it's really amazing video. Thanks for sharing it. Um, just. Yeah, there's a question for, for Dave. Um, what do you anticipate doing maybe with, with the EDL mic now that it's up and running? Do you see it having any kind of diagnostic uses during the deployments of the robotic arm and, and sort of like like the instrument checkouts and so forth? Um, yeah, I mean, what do you see it doing aside from recording Martian wind and the sound of the dirt under the wheels and so on? Thank you. Yes, we've had a lot of discussion about how we might be able to use uh, both the EDL cam microphone and the super cam microphone to do those type of diagnostic stuff. I mean, the ops team right now, I don't want to speak for Jessica, but they're focused on getting the system deployed and capturing noise of that is definitely not the first priority. They need to focus on getting this vehicle ready to perform some amazing science. But that doesn't mean in the future we could not sit down and discuss the possibility of capturing audio files of an actuator as it actually uh, spins on the surface of Mars. Um, you know, the, the noise is an incredible thing that engineers can use to basically detect the health of, of moving systems, gears and actuators and things like that. And so if we get a snapshot of an uh, of, uh, actuator today and, uh, you know, you can compare over time, do another snapshot, another audio file of that, uh, of that actuator in the future, compare the two and see if there's anything that can be learned in terms of the health of that, uh, that device. Now, with that said, I do need to remind everybody that... Uh, the, the microphone that's in the EDL camera system, just like all of the, the cameras and other hardware, is off-the-shelf hardware. It is not designed to live in the hostile environment of Mars. It gets down 120 degrees plus below zero at night, and then it warms up significantly more in the day to, what, minus 40 or something like that. So those temperature cycles and that cold temperature are going to significantly limit the life of, of these devices. They're just not designed to last for long periods of time. The SuperCam microphone might continue to work. It actually is designed a little bit more uh, for this particular environment. It can last longer. So I think, you know, as you heard, I think Dr. Z mentioned earlier, we're always surprised by how rugged and robust some of our items are, how long they actually last. You know, they, they continue to operate far longer than we designed them. Uh, we've gotten pretty lucky over the last couple of days. Perhaps we'll get lucky and the hardware will continue to operate uh, on the surface of Mars and allow us to do those type of diagnostic things in the future. I don't know, if Jeff, you want to add anything more about how you might consider using them? Uh, well, I can, I can say that that application was one of the things that we had projected uh, and tested and wanted to make sure that even though this was a capability that was part of the cruise and entry descent and landing software package that we're operating right now, we've also carried that capability forward into our surface software. And so, um, you know, yeah, assuming the hardware is good, we, uh, we're open and ready to use it. Yep, and I will mention um, to the question, we, we actually have gotten requests from instrument teams wanting to turn on the microphone to observe their instrument functioning. Uh, Moxie is one of the instruments that's going to be uh, generating oxygen, has compressors and scroll pumps and things. And they actually want, it, want us to use the microphones to do diagnostic acoustic measurements. Um, so I actually think that this might become something that all rovers might want because everybody knows that when you hear something squeaking, it's diagnostic, maybe you need to check it out and it tells you a little bit about how, the, how it works. And so uh, we will find out how these get used. It's actually kind of exciting um, and we're getting requests from the teams. So we're gonna, and we're working to, to put those into the plan. I'll just, I'll just uh, say I hope it does survive long enough so, so that we can hear those wheels crunch over the surface of the planet because I think we would hear it. And I think uh, it'd be great to hear that big rotary percussive jackhammer drill taking that first sample uh, of a rock on, on Mars as well. I think we'd hear that also. So I'm hopeful that, that our, our little microphone will hang in there for, for some of those events. 
Great, and up next is Lisa Grossman from Science News. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, the video is amazing, and a lot of it looks a lot like the um, animations that you've shown before the landing to, to kind of advertise this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Going forward, how will you distinguish the video, that is the real video, from the animations to kind of make it clear to people what they're looking at and keep them from getting confused or not be fuel for conspiracy theorists saying we haven't actually done this? I guess I could try to take that one. I mean, I think uh, we should label very clearly which ones are from Mars and, uh, and not. Uh, I think it's clear to a lot of us, but I think you're right, right, given the way that uh, the animation's been pretty good. Uh, you get in a, I get a sense for, uh, for how that could be confusing. I think we should label them going forward. Now that we have this kind of video, uh, we should be clear about what's, uh, what's real. What a great problem to have. Exactly, I mean, it's an amazing problem to have. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, do you have anything, uh, anything any thoughts? Or? Yeah, I, I, I can attest to, it's real, it's actually real, I know, because I know the data very well. It's, it's stunning and it's real. And that was our thought too when we first saw it. We're like, wow, this looks like, doesn't look real. Um, but it is, and that's what's so amazing about it. And, um, you know, I, I know I've seen some of the video games are getting pretty good. You know, second glance, you look at a sports game and it looks like it's real, but it's fake. But this is actually real stuff, and that's why it's so exciting. Um, and I actually just want to say, uh, for those of you that want to go watch the videos, personally, I like watching like quarter, quarter speed or even slower because there's so much detail in there uh, that anyone who's done animations know that knows that that, t that would take a lot of time to do. Uh, and it all happened so quickly and the camera cut everything. And so that's how, that's how we know it's real because we, we know so much about these, these systems, but uh, there's just so much detail um, that that's, that's one good way that you could, you could look at. Um, but yeah, it yeah there's, there's one other thing I forgot too. I remember early on uh, MSL when they started coming up with the animation for, uh, for Curiosity's landing, uh, we had a discussion about the, uh, the plumes actually coming out of the sense stage uh, and the fact that uh, that they were clear and that you wouldn't see them uh, in real life. Like you can, you don't see them in the rover upload camera. Um, but uh, we thought that it would be, uh, that people would be expecting to see them in the, in the animation. So they took some artistic license in putting them there. So here I can tell you now that hopefully our uh, future animations will, uh, will show the right thing and show the, the, uh, the clear plumes like you see in the real video. Yeah, and we, the same comment for the exquisite detail on the rover, if you actually look at you know, every Cal targets in place, every little twist, you know, every tie, cable tie, they're all there. In the animations, you usually don't have that. When you get down to that level of detail, at least at least now, you, you know, typically don't, because a lot of the things happen kind of last minute, and, you know, as the rover, rover's getting built, and people slap things on, and they're not in the drawing, so the animators don't pick it up. Uh, and that's another thing that's amazing about this video. Every single detail is in there, so I encourage people to look at it. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. It really is some beautiful detail. Now we have a social media question to take. Jerome on Twitter asks, on some pictures we can see dirt and small rocks inside the real wheel rim. Was this expected and will it become an issue if more dust and sand is picked up along the way? Yep, I can, I can speak to that. So uh, it's not uncommon for us to have uh, rocks and dirt inside the wheels, um, at either from the landing event or as we're driving across the surface. You'll also notice on the deck, uh, we also experienced some of that debris coming down on top of the rover. And we design our mechanisms for these conditions uh, so we don't expect any issue with the material from the landing event or as we continue to surf, uh, rove across the surface. Thanks, Jessica. And right now we have a call from Eric Berger on ARS Technica. Yes, hi. Thank you very much for doing this. Congratulations on such a stunning um, array of photos and, and videos. Um, Alan Chen, Chen, or Al Chen mentioned the dust earlier, and I, it was striking as the spacecraft got close to the surface how much was kicked up. Um, it's a one-ton rover. It's pretty sizable, but you know, when you're talking about human missions, um, it's it's much larger. And so, you know, what does you know what does being able to see this dust tell us about the challenge of landing future kind of much larger spacecraft on Mars? Is that something that you're going to have to account for? And if you know, is it going to be a really significant issue to deal with? Thank you. 
Yeah, I think I can take that one. I mean, I think, you know, as most people know right there, as far as I'm aware, there are no landing pads on, uh, on Mars or barges that we can land on, uh, prepared places. So we, we're going to have to deal with, especially if we're going to use propulsion, we're going to have to deal with uh, this plume ground interaction. And it's really difficult. It's difficult to get right, uh, to get the modeling right, to get uh, to understand it, or even to do a real test that, does, that shows a, a good impression of what you're going to come down on, especially when you don't know exactly where you're going and what the terrain is like. Uh, and what the ground properties are where you're coming down. So I do think this is a big challenge uh, for us going forward. And that's why collecting this information here is useful. Uh, we can certainly begin to see um, how it actually behaved in real life and see how things uh, began to move and what those scours are like. And we have a vehicle that'll tell us what the ground that we happened to land on was like. And we know how we were commanding those, uh, those engines and where they were pointed. So we have a, a rich treasure trove here of data that we can use to kind of a, get at that kind of challenge. Uh, but because I, I do think it's a big one, especially as we start to land heavier and heavier things uh, with bigger and bigger engines. And up next on the phone lines is Joey Roulette from The Verge. Hey, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, earlier it was mentioned that scientists are already uh, pouring through the thousands and thousands of images. And I was just wondering what about um, the surface or the rocks that you guys have seen so far from these images are standing out uh, and, and kind of what has been interesting from a scientific perspective. Thanks. Ken, uh, Ken's there. Yeah. Okay, Ken. Ken. Sure. Uh, so uh, you can go online and, and see that image uh, that was put up uh, during my little bit there. But um, we're noticing basically the different colors that we see and, and textures and tones. And, and so one thing that's striking to me, standing out to me and some of us, is that um, a lot of the, the rocks that are labeled as, as light rocks uh, seem to have a, a rough texture. Uh, whereas some of the darker rocks further afield that, that are higher standing, um, more like large boulders, um, seem to be smoother. Um, that can mean something about the, the grain size and, the, and the, potentially the composition uh, of the rocks themselves. One of the things we're, we're noting um, as the resolution gets better is that these, these light rocks uh, closer to the foreground may actually be kind of dark on the inside and that the light tone we see may be largely due to, to dust covering uh, and where the rocks stand up a bit higher uh, and have less dust, they tend to appear dark. So a lot of you know, new patterns are emerging. Um, and then of course, one of the most exciting and interesting things are these, what we call the holy rocks. Uh, that are, you know, in some cases right under our wheels and these smaller cobbles that are right around the rover. Um, I didn't mention, uh, but, you know, one of the possibilities for those holes is that they are what we would call vesicles, which would be uh, due to gas escape from a volcanic rock. We're not calling them vesicles at this point because we, it's important for us to stay open to the, you know, uh, different possible interpretations and not get locked in yet on limited data. Uh, but if they are volcanic, that is, is enormously important uh, to us because it potentially provides an opportunity to get a, a really nice uh, radiometric age or an absolute date uh, if a sample like that comes back to Earth. Um, but then again, if you go back to, to images from many uh, previous uh, Mars missions, rovers and otherwise, you'll see that that um, wind abrasion can cause those, those sorts of holes in all different types of rocks. Uh, so just a few of the thoughts that are that are emerging. And then, of course, we're starting to get views of the Delta front now, which just have us, you know, on cloud nine, uh, looking at some of the targets further afield that, that we're excited to explore. Great. Thanks, Ken. We have a, another phone line question. Mark Zastro from Astronomy Magazine. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess this is a question for Al. And uh, I was just wondering if you could speak to the performance of the landing vision system, uh, if you've gotten a chance to dive into that, how uh, the range figure and terrain relative navigation really performed and just sort of what it was thinking, how it was making its decisions as it descended. Uh, and then when you look at its performance and its accuracy, you know, how, how do you judge it? And can you see that improvement over curiosity? 
Yeah, that'd be great. I mean, I'm, I was really hoping for a chance to speak to that a little bit, actually. Uh, the Lander Revision System, as part of the Train Relative Navigation System, uh, really did great. Um, in fact, you know, here's some stats, right? The uh, Based on the targeted, well, we, we took many images on the way down. Uh, we got tons of landmarks. We were re very able to match up what we saw with our onboard map. Uh, it was almost perfect, better than uh, many of our field tests or even simulations. Uh, so we got a very good uh, good lock on where we were. And in fact, when you combine that with our safe target selection and where we flew to, uh, we only missed the targeted pixel by, by about five meters. Um, so we were aiming for a particular spot on the planet once it decided what was reachable and what the safest spot was. Um, and given, the, uh, given how well the lander vision system performed and our system in flying us there, we only missed by five meters. So that was really great. I mean, I think the, uh, we've really showed that this system can do what we, uh, what we wanted it to do in helping us figure out where to go and go to a safe spot. Great. Thanks, Al. We have so many questions coming in that we are going to keep the phone lines open for a little while longer. Remember to press star one to get in our queue. For now, I'm going to take a social media question from Bob on Twitter who asks, how does the processing power of the onboard computer compare to a great smartphone? Matt, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. That's, that's a good question. You know, in the space business, um, we have to build things that we know uh, are going to are going to work, and space is a pretty hostile environment. And the surface of Mars is even worse with the temperature swings, which we were talking about. You know, you need systems that are capable of um, of uh, dealing with the radiation and and the temperatures, and and really perform with very high reliability. So as a result of that, we have a tendency to use systems that have been around for a while, the well shaken out, uh, and on. Uh, on Perseverance, we're using the same computer uh, that we used on, on Curiosity, in large part because we know it worked and we wanted to have that successful flight heritage uh, that we had from, from the previous mission. So this is a computer that, uh, you know, uh, you would have found 15 or, or maybe even 20 years ago uh, that we're, we're flying. Um, having said that, these EDL cameras, which we were just talking about, are off the shelf, you know, state of the art new technology uh, and uh, it is always a thrill for us when we have the opportunity like we did in this particular application uh, to bring that kind of technology into our systems. Uh, it's a very powerful way to multiply our, our, uh, our functionality and our capability. And, uh, and so this was a great example of being able to use um, new technology. Uh, so, uh, so I don't know if that's uh, an exact answer to the question, but uh, in short, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a summary. Great. Thank you, Matt. And Thomas, uh, we actually have a question for you coming in. Hayden, an 11-year-old from Ireland on Twitter asks, what advice would you give to a budding planetary scientist in working towards maybe being part of the mission that will bring back samples to Earth in the future? Well, I'm so glad for that question. I think about that a lot. And the advice would I would give is, first of all, that's exactly the right time to get into that career. Right? And that, that now, there could not be a better time to join that career. Even if you started 10 years earlier, or, you know, in 10 years, now is the time to start that. Uh, the advice I would give is, uh, look, uh, go really start playing with data right away. You know, if, I mean, yes, go to school. You know, the teachers that are there are your best allies going forward. You know, the, eventually, probably you'll be perhaps at the university or at an advanced school, but go to school, do that. But the other thing I want to just uh, give you advice on, Hayden, is, is, you know, we're putting all these data out. Be your own researcher. Learn how to do that. Kind of go play with it. That's what research is so much about and find others who are just excited, as excited as you are. And I'm sure soon enough we'll have you on our teams in, uh, in the future. That's some great advice. Thank you, Thomas. And up next, we have on the phone lines, Alexandra Witz from Nature Magazine. Great, thanks very much. I'm not quite sure to address this to, but I wanted to ask about Insight and whether Insight had heard Perseverance lending. 
So I'm not sure anybody up here has the latest information. Have do you, Al? Have you heard anything new? I just heard from other folks on the team. I'm not sure this is official or not, but that they yeah. hadn't I, seen much yet. I think so. we'd have to check, uh, uh, to be honest, to, yeah. to be sure we get the right answer. So. Great, thank you. And then another phone line question from Jackie Goddard from the Times of London. Hello, congratulations, everyone. One of the most common questions that I get from readers who aren't generally a scientific audience, but regular folks, is what is the point of spending all this money to go to another planet and explore it? And sometimes that's not even a question, it's a statement. There are cynics out there. Um, can you say why we explore and how does humanity benefit from you finding out what you find out um, and doing what you do? Thank you. If anyone who wants to answer, time to answer. Uh, I can, or Tom, Thomas, did you want to? Thomas might want to comment. Yeah, well, why, don't I, why don't I get started and turn it over to you, Matt? Is that okay if I start? Matt, you good with that? Yeah, yeah that'd so, be great. So, frankly, I'm thinking about this question all the time. Uh, why do we explore? And, of course, when we do that at NASA, I just want to just let everybody know that if you look at how much money we're spending on each planet and the exploration of each planet. Of course, the majority, uh, kind of the, the money where the, the planet we're spending most money on, of course, is the Earth, uh, the place where we live, where our friends live, where our history is, and where, so, where our future is going to be. And so we're not confused about the importance and it's just as excited about the, the uh, amazing future of what exploration is uh, going forward. Exploration for us, though, is broader than just what is useful right now. And, and the reason we're so convinced that that is important is, first of all, uh, the questions that have driven humanity, important questions, truly historic questions, in so many ways are what we're really about, addressing those as what we're really about as humans. We want to be sure, you know, as we look at our contributions of our generations, that we really move forward uh, what we know and how also uh, really affect how we think about ourselves. And that so often comes through uh, research. There's a second reason though, it, it's truly secondary, but I'm gonna mention it anyway. So often and surprisingly, the, the results and the technologies that we're building for the very questions that are really driven by fundamental science questions are extremely useful. And I just want to remind you that perhaps today, whoever asked that question is driving around in a car with a GPS system built for an entirely different purpose and looked at the weather forecast, which of course was not anticipated when in fact uh, we built the first Earth satellite. So yes, we want to uh, kind of focus on the immediate needs today and it's really important, but it's so critical for us as a species to look forward and explore. Matthew? Thanks, Thomas. I, I think you said it really well. You know, I've been landing things on Mars now for 25 plus years. <laughs> and so I've had a chance to go out and, and talk to a lot of different people. And it's it's not unusual when somebody asks this question. And, and I used to, you know, have a long list of, of reasons. Uh, and, and there are a good long list of reasons. Um, but, but fundamentally, I've come to the conclusion that in some ways it's kind of a moot moot question um, because how can we not explore it's just who we are it's what we are it's in our dna you know you you almost you couldn't stop us as a species from exploring i don't think i think it's part of the reason why we're you know at the top of the food chain is because we're curious because we want to go to places we haven't been we want to answer questions we don't know the answer to uh, sometimes we want to find the questions we don't even know need to be asked. You know, it's just it's just part of part of who we are, and uh, and uh, it opens new horizons, uh, uh, new frontiers. It inspires us. Um, it inspires kids. Uh, you know, and as as Thomas mentioned, all the academic programs that 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 are paying attention here, uh, to science to technology. Uh, that that uh, we bring to the table that that's important for us, uh, you know, and uh, I think that's the best I can do to answer that question. Um, there's a lot of reasons. All right, we can move on now to another call from Matt Kaplan from Planetary Radio. 
Hi, everyone. Congratulations uh, from uh, not just me, but all of us at the Planetary Society. Um, <laughs> I've been texting with uh, our boss, uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, who has been watching uh, everything along with us. And uh, here's part of his reaction. Oh, my, this is astonishing, astonishing, dare mighty things. Uh, but here's my question for Ken Williford. Uh, Ken, getting these first images and video from so much closer to the surface of Mars uh, than we have from the orbiters, in spite of the great job that they're capable of, does this start to make you think about the potential of uh, doing this on a regular basis from balloons or, oh, let's say, a helicopter? Well, sure. Uh, you know, almost everything I'm thinking about right now is potential. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I guess I've compared it, um, you know, to several people who have asked me how I'm feeling, you know, what's it like? And, and the closest thing I can compare it to is I would say the birth of my daughter, you know, where, uh, the, the cruise phase that's about eight months long, you know, is like that, uh, that nine month period where you're just waiting and you're just hoping everything goes right. And then, and then she's born, uh, in this case, we're on the surface and it's real. And the potential is astounding. I mean, I was just, uh, Katie Stack and I were, were just texting last night as we got some new images down and, and we're just, you know, we're so excited, like, like kids just looking at every picture and, and seeing so many new things and having so many new ideas and new questions are appearing. Um, and, and the potential of it all is, is what strikes me more than anything. We have so far to go, so, so much to learn. Uh, and I just couldn't be more, more grateful, uh, to have made this transition from, from all the years of hard work and, and stress and wondering, you know, is it going to work out? How's it going to work out to now when we actually get to do this thing? Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's amazing. Thanks, Ken. And up next, we have Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Thanks. Uh, just looking ahead a bit, um, what's been the, this is probably for Jessica, um, have you made any progress homing in on a site for the helicopter flight demos? And um, if so, about how far from the Perseverance landing site um, are those? So the team has started to evaluate um, and is uh, using the images that we've received from entry, descent, and landing, as well as now these uh, images that we've acquired over the last couple SALs. Uh, we are fortunate to have landed in a potential um, spot for that, but the team is still evaluating and uh, is looking forward to additional imaging from the 360-degree panorama from the MassCam Z, as well as uh, uh, future data that's to come down. So we have not locked in a site yet. Um, that will still be uh, work for the team uh, to go looking forward, uh, whether it's here or a few uh, hundred meters away. Great. And we have a social media question coming in. Jake, who is 12 years old on YouTube, asks, was there one point you thought that this would be impossible to do? Uh, that, that's a that's a great question, Jake. Um, <laughs> there might have been many points when it felt a little impossible. I'll just I'll give you my one moment, and then the other folks may may want to add in. And that's uh, you know last March when the uh, COVID pandemic struck. You know we just um, we were we had just shipped the spacecraft down to Kennedy. Um, Dave Gruel, who believe it or not. This whole EDL camera gig is 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 not what he does for a living. He was our assembly test and launch operations manager, and he, along with his deputy Art Thompson, were responsible for assembling the flight spacecraft, testing it, and getting it down uh, to the launch pad for for launch. That's actually what he did for a day job. So uh, so the pandemic struck about a year ago, and Dave and I and Art and others. We're just constantly on the phone trying to figure out how to react to it and how to respond to it. You know, we, um, I said it before, we didn't have a lot of margin. We didn't have a lot of time. Um, uh, you know, we were, we were figuring out a lot of things as quickly as we could. And our focus was shifted from trying to get the spacecraft built and tested correctly and staying on schedule for the launch 
because if you miss it, you gotta wait two years for these planetary launches to Mars. Um, and suddenly our whole focus had to change to keeping the people safe and keeping their families safe as a number one priority. And I wasn't sure, honestly, I wasn't sure we could do that. And I, I knew that if we couldn't keep them uh, just as safe as they would be at home doing other things that, you know, uh, that that could be, that could be it for us for this, uh, for this opportunity. We got tremendous support across the board from the institution uh, here at JPL, from headquarters, Thomas and, and uh, SMD, uh, and we got through it, but um, that was the existential moment for me, uh, that, that very, uh, uh, that, that time right there, the first three to six weeks um, after, after COVID really hit hard. So anybody else? Same answer. Yeah, exactly. Same answers. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll add to that. Um, one of the things about that's interesting about this, this, these jobs we have are we spend years, I mean, seven or eight years for me and uh, all these guys, we, years and years, years of work, building, testing, making sure it's going to work. And, you know, I have to say there's some amount of stress um, involved when you spend seven years of your career doing something and then it all comes down to like one moment. And for me, it's obviously like those first images that come from the cameras. Like you really want that to work, like really, really want it to work. And you've tried everything you can do to make sure it'll work. And so, um, but you know, it, it's definitely, you know, we're, we, all, we try to be open-minded about what could go wrong. Uh, we try to cover, cover all, all our bases. And, um, and that's what's one of the great things about JPL is that there's a team of people here, really smart people uh, you go to these reviews uh, to review your product, your your designs. Um, we call them withering re reviews. You get you get a lot of tough questions, um, but that's one of the really you know, JPL is a real gem of a place because it, we built this culture of always questioning um, what could go wrong, um, but hoping for the best. And and it's it's a really interesting experience. I think we all share that. Yep, I, that will, I will agree. I think we invite the feedback from each other and our reviewers to make sure that we are thinking about all the things that we need to think about and pushing ourselves to you know, meet those challenges. And, uh, and of course you want it all to work, but um, you know, there, there are some things that you, know, you worry that you didn't think about, um, but as a community and as a collective and as you know, a team, you know, we use each other to help uh, make sure that we're covering those bases. I think the team really did persevere, and we are here today. Uh, up next is Leo Enright from Irish Television. Thanks very much, uh, Raquel. Uh, I, <laughs> I just realized there's no doubt about it. Twelve-year-olds definitely ask the best questions. Um, but if you'll forgive me for um, going geeky on this, uh, could somebody talk to the traversability of uh, Canyon de Chez? Now that you've seen these amazing pictures, um, do you think that you can just simply turn around the rover and head directly west-northwest, possibly right past the descent stage? Or realistically, are you going to have to go to the northeast um, around Olympic uh, and then to uh, Chamanfoya? I, I, I'm sorry for being geeky, but uh, it's kind of, a, a serious question. Can you move quickly? So I can, uh, I'll comment and I'll let Ken comment also. Uh, you know, we have uh, spent, you know, as we do in our development program, as we were mentioning, you know, a lot of time in different conditions to evaluate the performance of our system. Uh, and one of the things that we did on this mission compared to other missions was to enhance that traversability capability uh, with enhanced autonomous navigation and as well as processing um, while we're driving, so to increase our drive rates. Now, we have many more images um, still to uh, assess um, in terms of evaluating uh, our path forward, um, but I will uh, I'll let Ken speak to maybe some of the areas that we are interested in pursuing. And what's really great is that we work together you know, with the science and engineering team to evaluate uh, those paths and uh, what sort of um, terrain is the best for our system. 
Yeah, so it's a great question, and it's it's our major focus right now on the science team is is answering exactly that question. Uh, what are we going to do? What do we want to do? Uh, where do we want to go? Uh, and I'll say, first of all, we're so extraordinarily happy about uh, exactly where we've put down um, because uh, we ended up right on this major geologic feature, this contact, we call it, between uh, two... Um, two differently mapped units. And so um, you see there's this sort of uh, uh, undulating feature uh, that, you know, this sort of obvious line um, that we're, we're landed right next to, and, and that's the big contact. One of the major features we were hoping to explore in this mission, and it, it, it uh, presents for us uh, one of the big mysteries. Uh, I mentioned the, you know, the possible vesicles. Uh, it gets down to one of the big questions for us early on is what is that crater floor uh, made of? And are there igneous rocks there, sedimentary rocks, both? Uh, you know, and there's a lot of implications for both. So, so what I would say we're probably currently leaning toward is, is exploring that contact, which would naturally lead us more, I think, to the second um, of the two options, but we'll see. We, we've got a good amount of time while the team does the commissioning and checks all the systems out. And during that time, we'll be digesting all those new images and doing a lot of strategic planning, evaluating different options, um, arguing amongst ourselves in the team. Right after this, this uh, press conference is over, our first science team meeting uh, post-landing starts immediately after that. So we'll we'll start talking about just those things. Um, so we'll see. Great. Thank you, Jessica and Ken. Uh, up next, we have Stephen Gorman from Reuters News. Hi, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, so uh, my, my question is, I have like a question about the superlatives regarding the video footage of the EDL sequence and the audio of that gust of wind that was picked up on the Martian service by the by the Microsoft. So I believe, is it correct to say this, that this video marks the first sort of moving footage uh, of a spacecraft from a spacecraft from that spacecraft uh, showing its 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 uh, descent and, and landing on the surface of another world, you know, Mars or any world, I think, right? Uh, be that the including the moon or an asteroid or anything. From that. And then secondly, is this Likewise, is this the first sound recording ever made on Mars or any celestial object on Earth or just the first one that was made that's been played back on Earth? I was wondering if you could just uh, clarify that. I can um, – let's see. Uh, on, your, on your first question, uh, putting aside the Apollo program and the moon and just talking about planets, uh, this is most certainly – I'm pretty sure, as far as I know, this is the first time we've been able to see ourselves, see our spacecraft land on another planet. And, uh, and hopefully that, that answers uh, the question that you, you asked. Um, it, as far as sound, um, I'm not sure anybody else has any more information, but again, as to the best of my knowledge, uh, this is the first planetary uh, sound that's been recorded. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead, Justin. I can, I can, I can add to that. Uh, in terms of sound, the, the, um, the InSight lander has a seismometer on it, and they did measure uh, seismic signals that were acoustically driven and then rendered that as, as audio. So that, that could be potentially another, another one. But um, in terms of, like, imaging and doing video, um, MSL did have a, a descent imager that did video, uh, three and a half frames per second, so it was a little slower. Um, and that was the Marty instrument. Um, we've also done time lapse of deployments of things on InSight. You know, we deployed a seismometer and we do time lapse video. Mars Pathfinder, we did time lapse video of the rover driving down onto the surface. Uh, but then again, it was it's time lapse, you know, so seconds in between frames. Uh, so it, you know, it's you, you've probably seen those. They're all out on the internet. The the uh, rover movies. Um, I, w I worked on that as a postdoc actually, but this is definitely the best video of any of them. So I think we can at least say that pretty definitively. It's it's just, it's a whole nother level of, of capabilities that we now have, so. That's... 
Great. Well, that is all the time we have for questions today. Thank you so much to our panelists. We unfortunately can't answer all the media questions on there. For those with additional questions, please call JPL's Digital News and Media Office. Our social media team will continue to answer questions online, and we have a Reddit AMA with Perseverance team members starting at 1 p.m. Pacific time today. Now, to see the raw images of Mars, visit mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 slash multimedia slash raw dash images. For more updates on the mission, visit nasa.gov slash perseverance and mars.nasa.gov slash perseverance. And you can also follow us on social media using at NASA Persevere. I'm Raquel Villanueva. Thanks for watching. Deployed and we're against deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 440 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Charge. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. TBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. <laughs>